Baby Garcia. I'm the host of today's special Veterans Day virtual event here. Um, first and foremost, thank you all for joining us today. Um, we really appreciate it and happy Veterans Day to those of you men and women who served. Um, I will um, be speaking with some very talented guests today. Um, it's a behind the scenes casual conversation on um, filmmakers work. And um, one of the Marine Corps veterans that I interviewed during one of my many documentaries in 2018. And I'll, I'll touch base on that a little bit later, but um, just to kick it off. Again, I'm Baby Garcia. I served in the Marine Corps from 2013 to 2016. I was an aviation supply specialist um, in New River, North Carolina with Mouse 29. And um, to kind of break it down, Barney style, as we would say in the Marine Corps, um, I would inventory, maintain, and store aircraft material. And uh, we worked with the, um, a lot of helicopters and making sure that um, every part gets inspected. And I dealt with consumables, um, which were smaller parts like bolts um, and things like that. Um, so I always wanted to be a journalist. I was naturally curious and very determined to become one. Um, but I joined the military first to kind of solidify my dream goal of being a journalist first. Um, and now I'm a news producer for um, WCAV TV, CBS 19 News um, over here in Charlottesville, Virginia again. Um, and it feels great to be able to serve in this magnitude. I'm no longer wearing the uniform, but I'm bringing the skills and the value of being a veteran to my newsroom. And this is also something that we're gonna touch base on as we're talking with um, Jay Lucas, one of our special guests here today. And um, also Josh Aronson. Um, director of To Be of Service, um, which is a Netflix documentary um, that we will also touch base on. Um, you can just excuse me for one moment. And I'd also like to say thank you to those who submitted for our sizzle reel. It's on Facebook and LinkedIn. It's basically a highlight reel that captures the, the all of the great um, skills that veterans bring to journalism. And we also have one of our advisory board members, Alex Quaid, who is a, an award-winning war reporter and her work is also featured. So we in total had six submissions for that real video that's out now on our social media platforms. And um, we really appreciate everybody who took the time to submit great work. Um, unfortunately, we weren't able to uh, bring all of them to be on this panel um, due to scheduling conflicts on their end, but we have one of them here and that's Jay Lucas. Um, and, but uh, yes, and also FYI, for those of you who would like to watch this again, this will be recorded and to the panelists too, um, this will be recorded for your purposes as well, if you'd like to share. Um, so let's kick it off. Um, our first guest panelist would be Josh Aronson, um, and he's the director of To Be A Service, and it's a Netflix documentary that I watched um, a few months ago, and it's astonishing. It's about veterans and service dogs and how these dogs help veterans heal and go through their emotional and psychological trauma um, after combat. And um, it was very moving and it features um, John Bon Jovi's song. Um, and John Bon Jovi, if you don't know, his parents we're also um, Marines as well. So um, Josh, um, if you would like to introduce yourself further, please go ahead. Um, and we thank you for being with us tonight on Veterans Day. Well, thank you so much. It's just, it's really a pleasure to be with you. And uh, um, thank you for including uh, the film and, and me. 
Um, so I'm a, a documentary filmmaker for the past um, 20 something years. Uh, and before that I made um, uh, television shows and commercials and you know, MTV rock videos and almo almost everything, um, but, um, but full out narrative movies. Uh, and along the way, I just decided that I'd, um, I just, uh, of course my phone rings just when this happens. So let me just tell them, okay. <laughs> sorry. Um, I, along the way, I decided I really wanted to see if I had anything to say. So I stopped making docs, I stopped making commercials and really focused on documentary films. And um, uh, the first one I, I made was called Sound and Fury and uh, uh, it did extremely well and uh, sort of launched me into the world of documentaries where I've stayed for happily for the last 20 years making uh, films for PBS and Showtime and uh, Nickelodeon and a number of other venues. And uh, it's, been, uh, it's been a real a place of um, heart for me just to see you know with small crews and small amounts of money compared to commercials and big movies uh, you can really make a difference you can really change the lives of people uh, and uh, the latest one was this film to be of service uh, which took three years uh, and it's uh, as you said it's about veterans with PTSD uh, who after really years of struggle uh, it, with uh, meds from the VA with different kinds of um, therapy one-on-one -on -one talk therapy, group therapy at the VA, um, um, stories of just gross over-medication by the VA, um, um, self-medication with drugs and alcohol, uh, just too many suicides all around them, uh, really struggling. Um, some of the men and women are lucky enough to get themselves together enough so they can go out and get a service dog. And it focuses on how the service dog heals and brings them back to feeling and love and community. Uh, and it's kind of miraculous how powerful it is. And so I spent three years in that universe and um, I uh, just got such immense respect for veterans and um, who they were and first responders and uh, the heart and the commitment. And uh, it was a life changing experience for me to be with them for three years and to make this film. So. Well, thank you so much for, um, you sound like you have like an astonishing career and um, you know, highly experienced and um, passionate about storytelling. Um, so you said that it took you three years for this project to be released. Um, tell me more about the planning stages, like getting a crew together, um, the research development, the, um, you know, okay, like, let me, I think that this veteran would be great for telling, you know, his or her story. So kind of go through that process with me. Yeah, it, it, let me just say, it, it didn't take three years to get it released. Uh, it took three years to make it. Oh, okay, three years to make it, okay. And once it was made, uh, um, I'm ha happy to say that Netflix grabbed it right away, so that was pretty good. And it, it, uh, it launched on Netflix a year ago, on, on Veterans Day one year ago. So that was really, really great. Um, well, uh, it, the film, it took about three or four months uh, to research the film. Um, someone brought me the film, um, a producer from California, um, writer, producer named Julie Sayers, had the idea for the film, to make a film about service dogs and vets with PTSD. Uh, and um, together we sort of really looked at it and started interviewing veterans with PTSD with service dogs. And, uh, and I, it, like all films like this, I had to really learn. I had to start from scratch. So I spent about three months um, and just read everything I could get my hands on about PTSD, about veterans returning with PTSD and meeting uh, uh, service dog trainers and veterans with service dogs and uh, just immersing myself in the universe of this so I could find a story. Um, and we decided to focus in on three different veterans and follow them around for a course of a year from the time they get their dog and then how their life changes as a result of getting the dog. And we tracked them for a year or actually one of them for just over a year and the other two for just under a year. Um, and finding the vets to work with was a real challenge because veterans who are in the throes of PTSD uh, don't go out a lot. A lot of them are shut-ins. Uh, we wanted a real arc in the film, like any filmmaker, we wanted to see change as a result. So we were hoping to have um, veterans suffering with PTSD who were really suffering, who were really having a hard time uh, and then getting the dog, we were just praying that there would be huge improvements in their life and we would track that improvement. Well, so to get veterans to agree to let us film them was not such an easy thing because of the place they were at when, when we started. 
Uh, and what we did, um, and I'm familiar with this, um, this strategy uh, from other films, we went to the dog training organizations who focus on veterans. And we asked, we told them what we were doing. And we said we were looking for veterans who were about to get a dog. And the hope was that I, they would give me the names of vets who were coming to them in a month or two months or three months so that I could interview them, discuss the idea with them. Uh, if they were interested and it seemed right for us, I would film them before they got the dog, go to their home and see how their life was without the dog. And then go with them when they got the dog and film that and then go with them when they went home and then film the, uh, the result. So uh, in doing that, uh, several of the dog training organizations across America were very helpful. Um, and in general, we found about 10% of an incoming class was willing to talk to us. So if they were gonna have 15 vets coming in two months to, to get their dogs, uh, you know, maybe you know, one to three would say yes and be willing to let us even talk to them uh, and they'd be open to the idea of filming. And, and, you know, the, and that took some months to do. And as soon as we found someone that was really terrific and they agreed to it, I would just jump on it. Uh, in one case, Tom Flood, who's in the film, lives in Billings, Montana. Uh, and uh, we got access to him. I talked to him on the phone and I was on a plane the next day to Billings because he was gonna get his dog in about three weeks. So we really jumped on it. And I went and I spent a day with him and then call, I, it was obvious it was gonna work, called, brought a crew in and we were filming within a couple of days. So, um, and it was really virtually that way with all the three players, the three people that we followed. Uh, and, um, you know, one was in, um, uh, in the South, uh, in near Atlanta. One was in um, 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 far Rockaway, New York, made it a little more convenient because I live in New York, so we could film him a lot. And uh, the last one was in Billings, Montana, as I said. Uh, the dog training organizations were you know, in Florida and Massachusetts. So we did a lot of travel in this film and uh, we met a lot of veterans. Um, and in addition to the three vets with dogs, there were sections of the film that covered um, subjects that interested me, subjects that were um, uh, relevant to all of the vets. What does it take to become uh, a soldier? What is basic training? What is, you know, what happens to you when they really um, put you through uh, weeks and weeks and weeks of debilitating, ego debilitating work that will basically train you to kill and not hesitate before you pull the trigger because human beings are wired not to kill other human beings. Well, when you're in the army and you're in basic training, you have to overcome that natural hesitation. So I get into things like that. Why is it that veterans who go to war and have horrific times come back and 90% of them, despite the horror that they've been through, 90% wanna go back. They would do anything to go back. So we get into why that is and what that's about, which basically has to do with value and worth that when they're in the army with their buddies in their unit, they feel like they have value and they feel their life means something as opposed to what it was like for them at home. So there's a lot of very interesting sections to the film that has lots of other uh, uh, veterans in it. So it's not just the three people. So it's, it's a very dense film with lots of people, uh, lots of characters that were, I found fascinating. And uh, uh, we have a history of PTSD section. The PTSD is with us from the beginning of warfare. Um, Homer writes about it in the Iliad and uh, uh, Shakespeare writes about it and um, um, all great writers who cover war will describe characters who are impacted by what they see and what they experience in war. And uh, it, it's gone through many names. It was called, changed the name PTSD, post-traumatic stress disorder, actually came in in 1989. Before that, it was other, there are other names, soldier's heart and so on and so forth. So, um, that's basically it um, in terms of production. Um, the crews we got locally, you asked about crews. I used one cameraman that I took with me all over, but the crews we picked up wherever we were, of course, uh, but that's, you know, boring, small stuff. And um, uh, it was a year of filming and then it was a year of editing. And um, John Bon Jovi came in about six months before the end and worked with us uh, to really come up with a song that was just right. And he, he was a great help. Turns out John is a real artist and a real supporter uh, of other artists. And he was just a great pleasure to work with. And uh, we became friends and, you know, he's a, a, he's a wonderful man. So it was, uh, the film was really blessed for me.
Oh, well, I enjoyed watching it as a viewer and I just thought that it told the story very well um, and you dissected it very well. It has so many elements to it. And sometimes as a storyteller, you just, you don't know how to tell the story if it has too much information and you wanna make sure that you don't leave anything out. Um, and you captured it marvelously. And um, a, a question that I had was, um, I believe there was a scene about um, the VA um, that you've tried to reach out to the VA for a comment um, on um, numbers and how um, they wouldn't supply veterans with um, service dogs. And I guess I was just curious to know, like, um, have you had, like, was your, um, you reaching out to the VA, like a negative kind of thing? Like, how was that interaction in trying to secure an interview with someone? Well, um, we worked with, we followed our characters. So uh, each of our three characters were going to the VA and had therapy at the VA and had people they worked with at the VA. And we tried in each case to film the therapy sessions. Uh, and we weren't surprised to find that we were not allowed to film the, the therapy sessions. But I was allowed to meet the characters and I could have interviewed one of the therapists if we wanted to. We ended up not doing that because what I ended up doing is going to PTSD experts who were therapists uh, and uh, we had three or four of them in the film. And I, I picked very interesting, I found them interesting, soulful people who'd worked with vets for, for 20, 30 years. Um, and they'd been in and out of the VA, but most of them, they were in private practice. Um, in terms of the VA not supplying a veterans with PTSD service dogs, uh, that, is, uh, that is mandated um, by government, that the government wouldn't allow the VA to, to use government funds to do that. Uh, but they put, they've been pushing uh, the VA to, to do it. I'm sorry, I, I misspoke. Um, um, the, the VA uh, doesn't uh, supply dogs to vets with, with PTSD. And the government, um, Al Franken was the first one who tried to do it, um, was trying to mandate that the VA had to do it. And the VA had been resisting it for a lot of reasons. So although the VA will um, give dogs and pay for dogs for soldiers who are blind or who have physical disabilities, not for invisible disabilities like PTSD or, or moral injury, they won't do it. Uh, they have all kinds of reasons and they are, they're very careful about uh, explaining them. Um, and they've under, under government mandate, they're testing now to see what the benefits are of using a service dog to see if it's efficacious and to see if it's worthwhile. It's expensive. They're twenty-five dollars to $30,000 for the dogs. And if you consider 500,000 vets with PTSD, that's a lot of dogs and that's a lot of management and the VA really doesn't wanna go there. Um, but in the film, we show so positively how uh, beneficial uh, dogs are uh, that we used the film and we took it to Washington. Uh, Nancy Pelosi hosted us and, uh, um, and um, uh, announced us in the halls of Congress. And we had a screening in the congressional screening room for congressmen and for senators. And we're able to push this bill called the PAWS Act. And uh, it's now stuck in the Senate. Uh, and it's been there for a long time. It keeps coming up again. And we've really been pushing to try and get um, um, funds through the government to force the VA to do this. Uh, but to, to date, they won't do it. So every time a vet wants to get a dog, he either has to come up with the $25,000, $30,000, go out and raise it, um, get a scholarship from people who fund the dogs uh, at these dog training organizations. Um, and they can do that because there are funders who will pay for the dog, but the waiting list at those places is one to three years. So, you know, these guys and women are ready for a dog now and they really need it. And uh, I'm sure there have been suicides uh, among veterans waiting for a dog because it's 20, 22 suicides a day among vets who've returned from Afghanistan and Iraq, 22 a day. It's just awful. You're right. And, um, you know, kind of bringing back to the pause act, it really just shows um, how you brought the screening to um, Nancy Pelosi and Congressman, the power of storytelling can create change and contribute to hopefully making a change, especially for veterans um, who need these service dogs. Um, so 
you know, just by you showing it to the public and to lawmakers, um, it it really just shows like, you know, the length and how far storytelling can take you um, in making significant changes um, to veterans' lives and improving their health. Mm -hmm. um, so thank you for also mentioning that. Um, I'm going to open up the floor for at least one question. If anybody would like to ask a question, you may type it within the chat right now. Um, we'll wait like a couple seconds. Um, if you don't have a question, we will jump to um, our next guest speaker. Um, Dennis is currently, who is our other guest speaker, um, who is supposed to be speaking right now. He's currently um, on mute, um, but he is here. Um, he just was driving. Um, he got caught up a little bit with work, so he was driving, but um, he's ready to um, also be here very soon. Um, but yeah, um, any questions? Doesn't seem like we have any questions just yet, so maybe we can keep it moving. I do have one logistical question. <laughs> is uh, Dennis the, the phone number, the call-in phone number, is that? Um, I believe so. He said that he's listening with his mic on mute. Um, he was driving before. Uh, he is an attendee by phone. Okay, he said that via message. Yep, so that's most likely him. Um, but anyways, um, thank you so much, Josh, for being here today. Um, I really do appreciate you explaining what to be of service is about, and you are doing a great service in being a filmmaker and telling these important stories. So we thank you and um, hope you enjoy the rest of your day and, um, I also posted on the MVJ social media accounts more information on how you can access to be of service if you haven't seen the documentary yet. Thank you so much. Enjoy. No problem. Great pleasure. Thank you. Great to meet you, Jay. Very good to meet you too, Josh. Okay, so next we're going to have a Dennis Wright. And um, so, kind of backtracking in 2018. I was a senior in college and my team and I from Montclair State University, we went to Puerto Rico for spring break. And this was six months after Hurricane Maria happened. And this was my first taste in knowing how to report outside of campus and uh, a deep issue, which is, you know, hurricane disaster um, reporting. So um, we were staying in San Juan, the capital of Puerto Rico, for a week. And um, we were with three talented professors who are also my good friends and mentors. And um, at least 10 to 12 other students. And um, we helped each other a lot with our storytelling. And my mini documentary, um, Meals with Love, is about Chef Ivoni and World Central Kitchen, which is a huge organization that helps, um, you know, uh, people in need with food um, distribution and preparation. Um, you know, they travel to Haiti during the earthquakes. They went to Puerto Rico. Um, anyways, Chef Ivoni and World Central Kitchen, they teamed up to provide um, Puerto Ricans in rural, harsh conditions from Hurricane Maria um, and make sure they made sure that they were fed. And um, it was uh, near, uh, you know, like the jungle foresty part of Puerto Rico, um, not so much of a touristy kind of site. Um, but yeah, I saw a lot of devastation and joining me right now is Dennis Wright and he's also a Marine Corps veteran that I interviewed who happened to um, help Chef Avoni and World Central Kitchen in preparing the food and, um, and giving them to the people in need. So Dennis, can you hear me? You might be on mute still. There we 
there any way that I can unmute him? Okay, I'm trying to unmute him. I think um, it's something that he has to do on his end whenever he's ready, so. Okay. Um, sorry, I'm just sending him a quick message. But yeah, I had no idea that I would meet another Marine Corvette. Um, while I was out there in Puerto Rico. It just happened by coincidence. I saw him in the back. He had the Eagle Globe and Anchor on his black shirt. And I was like, yep, meeting another devil dog. Um, <laughs> he's saying that he mute, unmuted himself. Um, hold on one second. He said that he can hear me, but I can't see him. It might be an issue given the fact that he's calling in um, that his video function is not able. So Dennis, if you're able to uh, join the link by having the Zoom app that's on your phone or if you're near a laptop, um, that would be, I think, ideal. But okay. Um, out, I'm sure we can move on and come back. Yeah. Yeah, Dennis, um, if you can still hear us, I'm just going to move on to Jay um, and talk to him and then we'll get back to you towards the end. Um, so, so, me in, coach. <laughs> so um, we're Marines, we can adapt to anything. So um, welcome, Jay. It's a pleasure having you here with us. Happy Veterans Day. Happy belated Marine Corps birthday. So Semper Fi. Semper Fi. Um, so um, so tell me a little bit about yourself and um, your work. I would love to hear more about you because this is our first time we're actually meeting. Yeah, uh, I enlisted in the Marines in 2003 uh, after a couple failed attempts at college. <laughs> and um, I was an ammunition technician. I was first duty stationed in Okinawa, Japan. Uh, I was there for a year, and then I, I did the uh, Marine Security Guard program, which is, uh, there are the Marines that guard embassies and consulates around the world. I was stationed in Moscow for a year. Uh, and then I did my final two and a half, three years or so at Quantico, uh, Quantico, Virginia. And after I got out, I got out, I sort of had a belabored decision to make about whether or not I was going to reenlist or I was going to get out. And I kind of had it in my heart and mind that I wanted to get into filmmaking. And so I decided to get out and return to college. Um, uh, and I became a film studies major at Columbia University. Uh, I went on the GI Bill. Uh, they have an amazing program called GS, uh, the School of General Studies, that really caters to students who have non-traditional backgrounds. You know, um, a lot of veterans attend the school. Um, and, and, you know, a variety of other people with, with varying backgrounds. Um, right out of there, I started doing filmmaking, freelance filmmaking, mostly as an assistant director here in New York City. Um, I worked for a few years with on a variety of different size projects from gigantic commercials to little indie shorts to everything in between commercials, branded content, all that stuff. And then in 2016, I sort of became a little bit disillusioned with the work that I was doing because it felt like I was working a lot on stuff that didn't really bear any significant consequence. And it was a time of extreme consequence in my mind uh, in the country. And um, I wanted to, I wanted to, I wanted to make a shift. I really want to get more into, into journalism or documentary filmmaking. And so I applied to Columbia journalism school where I, uh, I, so I, I got my degree from there and I made a, um, I made a 30 minute or so documentary alongside my, my co-director, Abby Lieberman, um, called Something to Say. Um, that won a Student Academy Award last year for best documentary. Um, and yeah, and then I'm, then, yeah, that's basically it. Then I moved to Los Angeles for a couple of years and now I'm back in New York and it's gloomy and I love it. Well, awesome, thanks for that intro. Um, you seem to have accomplished a whole bunch um, and you know, it's, um, it's, it's nice to hear like different journeys that veterans go through in life and kind of finding your purpose. 
Um, and you seem to, you know, believe that filmmaking is your niche. And um, I'd like to know, how does your military background and experience bring out the best within your filmmaking work? Like what skills and value does your military service bring when you um, work on a project? Yeah, it's a good question. I think, well, I think it's like a compound, it's, it's, a, it's a compounding element. Like I, I really don't think that, um, you know, I've been out for a long time now. I got out in 2008, <laughs> which is insane. Uh, but I've been out, so I've been out for a long, long time. And in, you know, people don't even believe me when I tell them I'm a Marine anymore. You know, they don't see it. Like, I don't blame them. I don't really see it either. One of my best friends, who I was stationed with in Okinawa, I was hanging out with the other day. And he was like, I don't see it. And I knew I met him in the Marines. And um, so I, I really feel like I've, I've completed more or less my, my transition to civilian life. But as they say, you know, there, there's, there are elements of who you are, I think particularly in the Marines, but I don't really know, that sticks with you. Um, and I think for me in terms of my approach to filmmaking is it probably um, it's my attention to detail. It's my determination. It's my um, it's my like this strive that I have for like perfection in the work that I do. Um, but the reason why I say it's like a compounding thing is that I think it really because it it it's I don't think alone being a Marine would have, you know, if I tried to, to make something to say, for instance, right out of being, you know, right out, right after um, my enlistment was up, it wouldn't have been that movie, you know, it wouldn't, I don't know what it would have been, <laughs> it probably wouldn't have been very good. Um, but like it, it, my sensibilities have evolved over the past dozen years. My knowledge of filmmaking has expanded. Um, uh, my, my skill with the camera or whatever it is. Um, uh, all, all of those things I think add to, to like, to the work that I do. And it's hard for me right now to say like, oh, I am, I, I, my film is what it is, is any particular thing because of some spe specificity about my being a Marine. But what I will say definitively, definitively, is that I would not be where I am having made that movie, having gone to school, whatever it is, without, without my experience in the Marines. So right after getting out, you know, I started, I could be, like I said, I like did terribly in college. And so I, I, um, I went to community college right after, before I went to uh, Columbia for undergrad and, um, I was suddenly like able to do the work, right? Like I was like, this is not, not a big deal. Like I could just do this. Uh, what do you mean all I have to do is like study and like do my homework and show up on time and like I pass and I get good grades, great. And that wasn't who I was before by any stretch of the imagination. That was not who I was prior to, prior to being a Marine. And I think that being in the Marines helped that evolve and, and helped propel me and push me and put, helped me push myself to <laughs> to the challenges of, of school or whatever. Okay, um, well, thank you for sharing that. And I, um, and I can agree that um, I have certain similarities too um, within my military service. And um, it's the grit um, for me that um, definitely the Marine Corps has taught me to be very determined and work hard for everything that I do. Cause the best kind of reward is when you know that you earn something because you worked truly hard for it. Um, and I guess my next question, um, so when you're connecting with other filmmakers, do you kind of introduce yourself? Um, how do you introduce yourself? Do you mention that you are, you know, a Marine or do you just kind of, um, just kind of feel it out and network a certain way? Um, do other civilian filmmakers, are they intimidated or how do they react when, you know, you're trying to communicate with them? Well, there's one way that people react 
without fail when I tell them I was in the Marines and they look at my biceps and they're like, really? Uh, so that's like the first way that people react, no matter who it is. Um, uh, I, I do feel it out sometimes. I think, I think sometimes it makes sense. Like, you, you know, you, I mean, I, baby, I, I know that you can sort of, uh, identify with this, but like when you're talking to someone, like you can sort of see that someone might be, that might be a fact that someone in, it might be interested in. You could just sort of tell, like they might be that sort of person. Yeah. Um, and, and I will bring it up sometimes, but I actually rarely bring it up. Um, and it's in no way, it's in no way because I try to avoid it. Um, you know, I just don't think I want to, that to be the, the sole identifying uh, aspect of who I am. Um, but, you know, it's all over my resume. <laughs> like, <you> know, <laughs> I, I definitely like, you know, I think it's like a really important thing that people do know if they're like looking, you know, mm -hmm. because, because of like what you said, like it, 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 I think it is a particular type of person that, that becomes a Marine, becomes a veteran in general, like, and, and it does sort of, um, it does sort of suggest that that person is disciplined, that that person works hard, that that person is, um, you know, a, a whole variety of things. Right. So, um, yeah, so, I mean, I, I, I mean, I, I, I do feel it out, but it's definitely not something I, I, I lead with, you know, I think for me, I think that's, I think it's because for me, it feels like a little bit like a little bit like in that moment, it would feel like a little bit to me, like I was like trying to use it. And right. Like, like I just said, I don't mind using it like on my resume or like in a job interview, but like, I don't, when I'm meeting someone, when I'm networking with someone, it's not, I don't, you know, it feels like a sales pitch when I'm, and I was in the Marines. Like I, I just want to connect with that person. And if the, if the conversation goes there or if I feel like it's appropriate for whatever conversation that we're having, um, then I'll mention it. Right. And I can totally understand and respect that. Um, so I want to jump into your latest work. So on the Google homepage, viewers might, millions of viewers might yeah. uh, be looking at something that you produced. Can you tell us about it? Yeah, I didn't produce it. I, I, I was hired, I was hired by Google, uh, earlier in the year to, to direct a series of videos um, that were profiles about military veterans, reservists, uh, and, and one National Guardsman and um, a military spouse actually, um, who work at Google currently. Um, they wanted to really highlight, um, oh, Here's my, a Google result. my phone thought I was talking to her. Um, uh, they, they wanted me to, they wanted to highlight for non-veteran, non-military veterans at Google, sort of who these people are that they're working with. I think that veterans have, um, I think that veterans can possibly have a certain, um, I don't know, stereotype or people think that a veteran has to, like, is a certain way. And, um, and so, you know, rather that way, I, they felt like it was a good tool to sort of educate a, a lot of non-veteran Googlers who might not know that like, Hey, some of these like really smart, like brilliant, amazing, sensitive people that you're working with, they're also like, you know, whatever, former Marine or, you know, former soldier or whatever. Um, and, um, and, but also that like, they, they really love veterans. Google really loves veterans within the workforce. So they want to hire more. So they, this was also sort of like a, a tool that they can use to sort of attract, to say like, Hey, like, you know, yeah, it's Google. Yeah. You need to like meet a really high benchmark for all of these things um but if you got it in you you should apply for this work um because we want it and um so we wound up making we we interviewed 37 people one of whom was the marine buddy that i mentioned earlier um uh i so i'm very happy that one of my friends we did a video about him um uh, we wound up interviewing about 37 people. We called it down to ultimately seven videos. Um, they're all about a minute and a half. Uh, so if you go to google.com today, like there's a Veterans Day Google doodle, doodle. And then underneath that, there's like a little like promo, like click here to learn more about whatever. And it's at least you to a blog post. And at the very top of the blog post is one of the videos. That's, a, that's actually the only video that I directly edited. 
I was there throughout the entire like sort of production and post-production process uh, up until like they sent it out for color um, and mix, but uh, yeah. Yeah, so it's actually like a pretty exciting day for me. <laughs> like hopefully like a lot of people see some work that I've done, even though my name is nowhere to be found on it, but that's okay. Yeah, but still like, it's a big deal. You know, Google yeah. is like the most popular search engine. And you know, it, just the fact that you're doing something, you're producing these short videos or you're directing these short videos, um, excuse me for that, but um, you're directing these videos about veterans working for Google and you are a veteran yourself and you know, you're, you understand and you have that connection. Like when you're, I'm sure you're interviewing with veterans and they, they feel comfortable. Um, That's with true. <clears throat> and yeah, I think yeah, that, <clears throat> yeah, and I think that is my experiences too with doing stories on veterans. Um, I um, aired a story that I helped co-wrote, um, co-produce with our Morningside reporter um, about veterans and yoga and how it helps them find the calm during those chaotic moments um, where they just want to you know, kind of find mindfulness and relaxation. Um, and they go through, you know, traumatic experiences after service and, um, and, you know, interviewing some veterans about, you know, yoga or just anything really, it, you know, it provides that comfort level knowing that they're being interviewed by one of their own. Mm -hmm. um, so I see that definitely as a competitive edge and um, a benefit in bringing out that storytelling. And, um, and on Veterans Day too, where, you know, on a popular search engine, it's going to get a lot of traction. And have you, you know, take a look, took a look at the numbers. Is there a way where you can check like how many people are viewing it? I don't know. I'm sure I can ask or whatever. I, I, I don't, I don't, I don't know. Because I would want to know, like, um, by the end of the day. Know. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but, uh, yeah, so um, that's very exciting stuff. And uh, I haven't had time to take a look yet, but I would definitely love to. Um, yeah. Yeah. I, 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 yeah. I definitely, I think you might appreciate it. I, I definitely encourage you to do it. Um, some really, really amazing stories there. Um, we, we uh, tried to get every branch of service um, uh, represented, but, um, you know, we actually did an interview with someone from the Air Force, but like due to, do it. so, um, uh, you know, given the, the timing, you know, this is COVID, we had to get really, um, creative about how we conducted some of these interviews we did i did two in person but i did it remotely with a with a crew filming out in you know near and near google's headquarters in california and then we did two uh, three others actually um by sending them out like a kit with you know a, uh, like a moment lens and case and a little light panel all this stuff and it, they wound up looking really really good for the most part but one of those, just because of technical situation, a technical situation after the interview, we couldn't use it. So, um, but there's someone from, you know, there's a couple people from the army, <clears throat> somebody who was like, who has spent 35 years in the army. My buddy who was an enlisted Marine, um, is a military spouse, which I think is a really important, um, perspective to have. Um, so, yeah, we're, I'm really happy with, with that video as well. And someone in the National Guard who's still, who's, you know, was called up two times already this year in, 20, in 2020. So, um, yeah, we've got a really, some really interesting perspectives. And I encourage, so I encourage you to check them out. I think you might like them. Awesome. Um, well, we're going to jump to um, our next special guest, our last special guest. Um, but I thank you so much, Josh, for taking the time to be with us today out of your Veterans Day. You could be, you know, out, you know, celebrating, but you're celebrating with us. Yeah, yeah, I am. <laughs> um, I, I, I'll probably have a glass of wine. I'm <laughs> mellowed out these days. So. Yeah. <laughs> well, cheers, you know, um, 
happy Veterans Day, happy belated Marine Corps birthday. Belated and birthday, um, yeah. it's a pleasure speaking with you. And check out more of Josh's work. Um, we will be posting it on our social media as well um, with the, um, the link that you provided and um, the passcode cool. for your film. For the film, great. Yes. All right, have a great night. Thanks again. Thanks, you too. Bye. Okay, so um, just to shortly recap, um, I will be joining um, Dennis Wright that I interviewed um, in Puerto Rico back in 2018 um, after Hurricane Maria, um, six months after Hurricane Maria happened. And I haven't seen Dennis um, since then. Um, so this is exciting to kind of follow up with um, and check back in with. Um, so Dennis, can you hear me? You might still be on mute. Hi, baby. Hi. <laughs> How are you? <laughs> I'm good. How are you? Outstanding. Couldn't be better. Happy Veterans Day. Happy birthday to you and to Josh. Oh, thank you so much. Happy belated Marine Corps birthday and happy Veterans Day to you. It's so good to see you after two thank years. You. I Two wonderful years I haven't seen you. <laughs> yeah, I believe it's already been two years. Yeah, it's two years since um, we first met. And earlier I was going through, um, you know, with our participants, how, um, you know, I saw you when we were, my team and I from Montclair State University, we went to um, at Juntas where Chef Ravoni was preparing food. And you were in the back wearing your Marine Corps shirt with the Eagle Globe and anchor and, I was like, I caught it right in the corner of my eye as my professors and the other students were going to the left. And then you were like, yeah. And then I was like, raw. <laughs> uh, <laughs> and my professors were literally like, what the hell are they doing? This is a secret are you language. a different language? <laughs> yeah. yeah, like this is a language that I do not understand. Um, so yeah, it just, it felt, um, so that was, it caught me by surprise um, to see that there is a veteran helping with hurricane disaster relief. Um, so I would kind of want to go through like what you've observed and what you've seen on the island when you were there back in 2018. Can you kind of like uh, revisit, you know, those moments that you were on the island? Yeah, absolutely. Um, first of all, it's great to see you again. Thank you for having me. Um, and uh, Puerto Rico was an amazing experience. Uh, we got to see the best and the worst of humanity as as you often do in these situations. But we went down there after spending about three months in Texas after Hurricane Harvey. Um, I sent everybody home for the holidays and then a bunch of us jumped back on a plane and went to Puerto Rico. Um, we found a spot to work out of, out of a restaurant, a local restaurant um, in Lares. And from there, uh, we hooked up with Chef Avoni, um, as well as Chef, um, Chef Andre, Andres, Chef Andres, um, and the World Central Kitchen. And we basically started a, it was almost like a Walmart, you know, we were working directly with um, FEMA, and we would get shipments of supplies that we needed, and we were setting up uh, basically a distribution line. Uh, we were giving people basic supplies that they needed. And then we hooked up with World Central Kitchen and started to be able to provide hot meals for people. Some of these people hadn't had hot meals since the storm. You know, they hadn't had power since the storm. So they couldn't keep any perishables. They couldn't keep any meats. They had to cook everything right after they bought it. So some of these people hadn't really had hot meals or cooked meals cooked by somebody else, you know, since the storm started. So it was an amazing experience being able to help that many people. Um, at the same time, it was it was hard to be in an area that we saw so much support in Texas after the storms. To go down to Puerto Rico right afterwards and see such little support, um, it was it was hard because so many people there were resentful towards the mainland for the lack of support they were getting. So at one point we were hand delivering supplies because in order to get supplies up into the really rural parts um, of the island, People hadn't seen FEMA the entire time. It had been six months since the storm and they'd never seen a shipment of supplies. They'd never seen any help. Um, the corruption down in Puerto Rico is just rampant. Um, that little island has 80 mayors. You know, Every little barrio has its own mayor. 
and corruption starts at the top at the docks and it just drizzles down. So the people on the other side of the island from San Juan up in up in the hills, they, they never saw any support. So we were literally taking truckloads of supplies while we were armed into the hills and dropping them off at people. And some of these people didn't even want to see us. You know, they were so resentful towards the mainland for kind of leaving them out and being the redheaded stepchild. So, and then at the same time, there were people that, you know, they, they couldn't show us enough, you know, enough thanks. So it was amazing. I know you got to see it. I know, I remember when we met and you were out there and I think you had a little bit of an emotional moment just seeing how much these people needed. And, you know, it was really, it humbles you to be able to be able to do something like that and give back when, you know, you come from the mainland, you have everything, you know, you're sitting at a Starbucks watching the videos of everything going on in Puerto Rico. And then you go down there and you start actually helping. It's, it's kind of puts you, puts things into scope. Absolutely. And, you know, kind of going back to that emotional moment, I was just so overwhelmed with the kindness and generosity that strangers are giving for each other. They are giving the clothes off their backs. They are, you know, giving what food and resources that they have for people that they haven't even met, but they just understand that they are struggling. And um, after the hurricane, um, you know, it many areas, um, the foresty type areas were, you know, devastated. You would see cracks on the roads. You would, um, you know, just hear um, these stories about, you know, people not having power in months. Chef Vivoni's power was drifting um, in and out a lot. And, you know, cooking under those circumstances is not easy. Um, but you guys, you guys really pulled through and made it work and you adapted and overcame for sure. Um, and I mean, I guess I want to know now, like, you know, would you ever go back? Um, what would you do differently? Um, given that the state that Puerto Rico is in, I, um, I've been trying to keep up with what's going on in Puerto Rico now. Um, voters have um, voted to make Puerto Rico into a state, but it cannot be passed until Congress has um, the say. So, um, so that is something that I've been kind of keeping track of. Um, and there's still like, there's still disaster relief that still needs to be um, sent to Puerto Rico, resources and food and water from the earthquakes that happened um, you know, between, I think it was last year that, um, the major earthquakes happened, but, um, so, you know, tell me about, like, I guess the first question would be, would you go back to Puerto Rico? And if you would, you know, what, what else would you do to help people on the island? I would absolutely love to go back to Puerto Rico. I think about it all the time. Um, as a matter of fact, for a long time, first six months I was back, I actually had a I downloaded an app that was the Koki, which is a little frog that you hear at night everywhere. Um, Cause I couldn't fall asleep without the Koki in the background. <laughs> so, um, but yeah, I would absolutely go back. I'd love to. The biggest problem that, that they have right now is that they're never recovered from the last storm season before the next one hits. Um, the poverty down there doesn't enable them to really recover and rebuild. Um, most of the structures aren't that, they aren't so that they can, they aren't built so that they can withstand storms, you know, so they build these structures knowing that the next year, most of them are going to get blown down or they're going to get flooding. So, you know, they call it the land of the blue tarp roof. When you fly over, when you fly into Puerto Rico, you're going to see all these blue roofs and people don't even bother rebuilding their roofs anymore because they know that the next season, it's just going to get blown off. So right. um, I think probably the biggest thing I would do differently is try to develop a better supply chain that I knew couldn't get interrupted or couldn't get pilfered from, you know, the politicians and the police and all the corruption that happened down there. Um, get it straight from the store, straight from the dock so you can get it out to the people because half the, half the supplies that we were ordering, what, what they weren't getting to us. And if we can't, you know, if we can't get the supplies and we can't get them to the people. So I think just setting up that, that supply chain, you know, I got to work with a bunch of great, people down there. Um, Ray Guas is, is a fellow Marine as well. He was my contact at um, 
at FEMA and he helped with a, he had a new water filtration system that he was getting up and going that was going to be really revolutionary, but getting anything done down there because of the corruption, is just, it's impossible. It's like trying to get something done at the VA. <laughs> so um, I think, like I said, getting a better supply chain and just getting clear parameters on who needs the most help, because there were a lot of people that would come get help that didn't actually need it. And that's why we really started taking trips up into the hills with supplies of our own, because you really get to go door to door and you get to see these people that actually need it and people that don't have the ability to come down to where the supply centers are. Um, and a lot of these people, they don't speak English, you know, so the, most of our people in our organization were non-Spanish speaking. You know, we had one saving grace, Melissa Torres, who was there with me and she was able to, to basically be our interpreter for the entire operation, which was amazing. Um, but I would absolutely love to go back. Um, I was in a unique spot at the time where I was in between careers and was able to have almost a year and a half off where I was able to go to Texas and then Puerto Rico. But, um, you know, my daughter's almost out of college, so I don't need to, to have as much money to live here pretty soon. So I'm seriously considering the possibility of making a career change into just doing disaster relief and working with other veterans. Because like you saw when we were down there, the veterans doing it together, it was, it was like therapy for us. You know, it was, it was bonding. It was being like on deployment again, sleeping on cots, helping out the public. Um, and it really helped a lot of the veterans that were down there. So I would like to actually, you know, see us start a, a veteran disaster relief organization where veterans can come from all over the United States, all over the world, and come help out people because it really does help us give us back that sense of service. Wow. Um, and I think that's very, um, it's very courageous and, you know, noble of you to continue that sense of service again, Dennis. And I really hope that you know, it does work out for you. I think you have a huge heart from what I've seen in Puerto Rico. And I know that you just want to be there to help as many people as you can. Um, and um, we have to wrap up, unfortunately, because we're running um, out of time. But thank you so much for taking the time on Veterans Day to um, speak with me about your experiences in Puerto Rico. Um, my you know, how long of a trip ago it's been. It's been two years, but it feels like longer. Um, but thank you again. Um, take care of yourself, be safe out there and um, please stay in touch. I will, thank you for having me. Happy Veterans Day to everybody out there, uh, especially to those of the families that still have people overseas and to those that didn't come back. So thank you, baby, I'll talk to you soon. I'll talk to you soon. Thanks, Dennis. You're welcome. Um, so we're going to wrap up. We only have like a minute or two left, but real quick, I just wanted to say we have a lot of great things happening here at MVJ. We're relatively new. We've only been around for about two years, um, but we're doing big things. We just got a grant from the Knight Foundation, which we are so grateful for because this is going to open up many doors for veterans to um, get hired in newsrooms. We're going to be giving them more resources, opportunities, more programming and um, you know, hopefully more virtual conversations like this, um, given the circumstances of the coronavirus pandemic. Um, we also are hiring um, for a position and uh, you could check it out later today or tomorrow, um, tomorrow actually for um, that link on how to apply. And um, you can follow us on social media, follow video consort, um, cons I'm sorry, I can't talk right now. Um, oh, there's, um, yeah, the video consortium too. So I can drop yeah. in a link um, for anybody who would be interested in their uh, global community. Uh, we're filmmakers all over the world, veterans as well as non-veterans included, but um, it's just always nice to connect with fellow storytellers. And thank you so much for having us and doing this joint event. Yeah, and follow us on social media as well. We're on Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, and LinkedIn. Um, you feel free to apply for a membership. You can um, apply to be a volunteer. You can contribute a, you know, a blog if you'd like. Um, just reach out to us, email us at info at mvj.network um, and connect with us um, if you have any questions. But thank you so much. And I, I hope you have a blessed Veterans Day for those of you who serve. And, um, you know, for your families, enjoy this day as well, because you guys are the backbone and help support veterans as they're going through um, 
whatever it is they're going through. So thank you and have a good night.